Good morning. My name is Jim Bench. I'm a retired uh, police detective. Uh, today's date is March 8, 2018. This is uh, a short rendition uh, about a project I've been working on uh, in Hawaii. I do not live in Hawaii. Uh, I've been there a few times myself, but the, uh, the evidence in this case took me there. This project began in 2012 for me. Uh, but it's a continuation of a project that I worked on as a police detective back in 1993 when I was investigating the cold case murder of uh, Tracy Nee, who was a little seven-year-old little girl uh, abducted on her way to school. She was recovered uh, uh, the next day, uh, deceased, and had been sexually assaulted. I did develop a uh, one suspect in that case. However, I interviewed many persons of interest. Uh, unfortunately, uh, I retired uh, before I could complete uh, my investigation of that case, and as far as I know, it was never solved. Uh, the suspect, the main suspect I was looking at back then, uh, was a good suspect and needed to be followed up on. But uh, looking back on it, uh, on rev revelations that have happened to me, since then, there were uh, there was another suspect that I did interview back in '93, but didn't consider him a viable suspect at that time. Um, this second, uh, we call him suspect, but he was really uh, just a person of interest. He and his brother, uh, Todd Sean Law, and his younger brother Aaron, uh, were interesting to me because um, Aaron, the youngest, uh, had been incarcerated as a juvenile before. And uh, I felt the need to review um, that case because uh, they lived close by where Tracy Neep was abducted. But right about the time I was actually uh, reading about that whole case, uh, I received a communication from the Hawaii Police Department in Hawaii that Aaron Shanwa had been arrested for uh, murdering a little four-year-old girl in Hawaii by the name of Lacey Woolsey Rao. Todd was with him when this happened. In fact, Todd was on his way back to Colorado after his brother had been incarcerated. And so when Todd arrived in Colorado, I snagged him up and interviewed him. He told me all about his brother, told me how his brother had confessed to him and that he had nothing to do with it. He was an innocent bystander and all these types of things. But there was something strange about Todd when I interviewed him. Uh, he was a um, young man, um, easily uh, liked, uh, had a um, personable uh, personality, and uh, wasn't the kind of person that you usually look to uh, first impression as being uh, uh, someone who might be involved in two horrific murders. Uh, but his brother, uh, on the other hand, I didn't know anything about him except his, his history. Uh, and that kind of surprised me because uh, his brother uh, had severe um, psychological disabilities and was actually institutionalized. I, I called it incarcerated, but he was, it was an actual institutionalization because he had trouble um, functioning, heard voices and uh, roamed the house at night and, and so forth because he couldn't sleep. So he, he was uh, mentally incapacitated and actually too young to have been considered a suspect in the Tracy Neef murder. Todd Sean, Sean Law gave me a lot of information about the uh, murder in Hawaii, uh, although it wasn't my case, I was interested in it because I couldn't understand why a brother would turn in another brother for a murder and actually initiate the, uh, the activity of this that precipitated his arrest. Uh, and I questioned him about that. I said, you know, why did you turn your brother in? You have a strong bond with your brother, uh, yet you uh, turned him in knowing that the only evidence against him was your testimony, and, and he said that bothered him too at the time, and he actually called his grandmother to see what he should do, and she's the one that told him to call the police. I have had many years' experience interviewing uh, suspects in a multitude of different kinds of crimes, and there's one thing in common that they all have, and that is that they don't necessarily admit to the crimes that they did, but when they do, 
admit to uh, violating the crime, uh, they make it look as if there was someone else responsible for that. And this is what uh, Todd Shanwa was doing with me. And I felt uneasy about that uh, interview with him, and I, I just had suspicions about what he was telling me, so I called the Kauai Police Department and told them that I had interviewed this. And I uh, talked to a Sergeant Asher. He told me that they had already made their arrest and they weren't interested in any new information in the case. That is not the way traditional investigators think, and uh, I was very surprised. And so, after I retired, I wrote a book called Closed Eyes, and that book was about my uh, investigation of the, the murder of uh, Tracy Neep. And you can buy that book in Amazon. Here it is right here. Uh, it's also available in any bookstore you go to. And I devoted a chapter in that book about the Shanlaw brothers, Aaron and Todd, because they were uh, part of the process of either coming up with another suspect or eliminating people as such. So what happened between uh, the time I retired in 1993 and uh, when I say this all began for me again in 2012? Um, I was retired, living in San Diego, um, on a yacht that I had um, owned for several years. One day, I was contacted via email by a woman. Her name was Tiffany Konekel. And uh, following uh, contact by email uh, by a friend of hers. And uh, they were both concerned. Uh, they had apparently written, uh, read the book that I wrote, Closed Eyes, and uh, honed in on the names uh, Sean Long because Tiffany Koneko's boyfriend was Todd Shanlaw. Uh, Tiffany had some concerns about him and about his interest in actions uh, revolving around one of her grandchildren. To make a short, long story short, Tiffany, uh, Todd had been out drinking one night or maybe a drinking in the house, and Todd had admitted to her that he actually had something to do with the murder of Lacey Rupp in Hawaii, and that it was he that that placed her in the ocean where she was found. Uh, he even uh, told her that de little details about how he weighted the body down, the fact that her brother couldn't swim, and that he could, and uh, pretty much in, uh, involved himself in that murder in my eyes. So I took that information, and uh, I assembled it in a fashion that could be uh, logically understood, and picked up the telephone and called the Hawaii Police Department. And I talked to uh, Sergeant Asher again, believe it or not. I explained to him that I had spoken with these women up in, in um, Oregon, that I had recorded telephone conversations, I had emails, and that there's another suspect in that murder that they investigated back in 93. And I again got the same response from Sergeant Asher that I did before. Is we're not interested in the information that you have. And this just boggled my mind. Why wouldn't an investigator in any police department be interested in a possible second suspect in a crime, especially the murder of a four-year-old child? It just didn't make any sense to me. So rather than uh, bother the quiet police department anymore, what I did was I had requested you know, police records via the Freedom of Information Act and also the court records to see if it was worth uh, pursuing anymore because if they had a very, very strong case against uh, Aaron Shanlaw, uh, it just wasn't worth my time to pursue it any further because maybe uh, Aaron, or uh, correction, Todd, was just spouting off as a drunk person and, and it made, wasn't the truth. So I got the police records and the court records and found all kinds of discrepancies and violation of criminal laws and so forth. It was the, one of the poorest uh, investigations I've ever seen, even from a rookie cop, and I used to train rookies. I couldn't believe it, actually. They uh, they got a uh, arrest warrant on Aaron Shanlaw without proper documentation. Uh, they withheld information from the courts in order to make it fly. To me, uh, and, and actually, Aaron never really admitted uh, to the crime himself, uh, he was sufficiently cognitive that he asked for an attorney, and and even uh, accepting a plea in his case was uh, a plea of no contest, which means he wasn't admitting to anything, but he agreed to uh, accept the consequences. Well, that raised a lot of red flags to me, and, and uh, I increased my 
uh, investigation to include interviewing witnesses uh, in Hawaii that the Hawaii Police Department never talked to at all. Also, um, I also interviewed Aaron Shanlaw uh, in prison. He was in a private prison in uh, Arizona. He wouldn't talk to me personally, but agreed to communicate with me uh, via mail. And so we communicated over the next few months. And I began to develop a picture in my mind of the relationship between Aaron and Todd and uh, questioned Todd about the um, situation in Colorado where he was incarcerated or institutionalized. He explained all of that to me with my satisfaction. Uh, sounded uh, via email, correction, via mail to be uh, telling me the truth. However, um, there's nothing as good as a uh, personal interview, which I was unable to get. So I was able to get the information on the victim Aaron's little sister in Colorado, who was the victim of the sexual assault that he had committed, and interviewed her, and I made a startling revelation. She told me via her husband, she's a grown woman now, and they live uh, out on their own, that it was not Aaron who committed the assault, it was Todd. And apparently he had been assaulting her since age five all the way through about age ten. The big question I had was, if that's true, why would you, as well as your parents, tell the Department of Social Services and the police department that it was Aaron? And their reason, or the reason they told me was that Todd terrified the family and threatened uh, all of them bodily harm, so to speak, should any one of them uh, involve him in as a suspect in that crime back in the late 80s when that happened. To make their point, the victim told me that she had a pet gerbil when she was a little girl, and Todd held it up in front of her and strangled it to death and said that that was going to happen to her if she ever ratted him out, so to speak. So after my investigation uh, into the uh, Neef case, and now looking into the Tracy Wilsey Ruff murder, um, and researching, lots of research. I learned, based on my previous investigations and interviews, as well as what I was reading from other investigators, as well as the medical community, that uh, pedophilia is a basically, in many ways, misunderstood psychological issue. And what I believe is you're born as a pedophile, just like you're born heterosexual or a homosexual. You can't control it. So therefore, if you are investigating a sexual assault on children, uh, pre-puberty children, you are looking for a pedophile. You're not looking for a heterosexual or someone else who might uh, be accused of doing that crime. Your main suspect should be a pedophile. And therefore, I uh, also realized that it was Todd Shonlaw that was the pedophile, not Aaron. And so then it made sense to me that Todd Shalma would turn his brother Aaron in uh, for the crime in Hawaii when it might have been her Todd. And, uh, uh, Todd maybe was telling the truth to his girlfriend. And part of the interviews that I did, or another person I interviewed, was a man who lives in California now who happened to be uh, one of the persons that recovered the body of the child, uh, Lacey Wilsey Ruff, in the 30 feet of ocean off of Anini Beach in Kauai. It was a very interesting um, conversation I had with him. I actually had two or three of them. He was never interviewed by the police department. Who ever heard of not interviewing the person who discovered the body of a homicide victim? I never heard of that. But apparently uh, they thought that was the way they were doing business as investigators in Kauai. And by the way, I'm not the only person who is making allegations, uh, you know, hear about them later, about corruption within the Kauai Police Department. But before this, there was a man who was a um, respected journalist in Kauai by the name of Anthony Summer. And he wrote a book called KPD Blue, and this is the book right here. It's also available on Amazon, and it's very enlightening as to how the Kauai Police Department, and probably actually police departments in Kauai, in or in Hawaii in general, uh, conduct business. It's a very politicized system. 
very uh, high-handed, brutal types of investigations uh, and uh, much corruption. And so uh, I wasn't, or am not, the first person to to see through the facade that they would like you to believe through their interviews and so forth. They are, they haven't changed much since the 70s uh, up until now. Uh, the person that I interviewed as the person that recovered the body actually recovered it in conjunction with the Timmy Woolsey, the child's father. They they weren't looking for the body on their own because the quiet police department couldn't find it. And that whole scenario is not included in any of the police department files. But uh, when I asked him if I could use his name uh, as a uh, corroborating witness uh, in the documents that I was providing or putting together, he said he'd rather not because he said he knows how the quiet police department is and that it wouldn't be safe for him to return to Hawaii and visit his friends and relatives there if they knew that he was providing uh, direct communication with me. And later on in the investigation, uh, Timmy Woolsey told me the same thing. In fact, he told me that one of the investigators for the prosecutor's office also made innuendos that it wouldn't be good for him to continue talking with me about this. The name of that investigator is, uh, his name is John Burgess. Uh, I communicated with him uh, on the telephone uh, as well as in, in emails before giving him the information that I had accumulated thus far to help them reopen the uh, murder case. And I later found out that the only reason that he was making the phone call to me was because Eventually, I had to go public with this information. I couldn't get uh, the FBI to respond to me with this. I couldn't get the Hawaii uh, Attorney General's office to respond or, or have had a favorable um, outlook on, on what I was trying to tell them. And I couldn't get the federal U.S. Uh, attorney to uh, look into it either. And all of these things added up meant that there was much more information I needed to know about because I couldn't understand why these police agencies were uh, was a conspiracy to uh, keep this whole situation silent, keep it under wraps. Now, the only thing I could figure out really is because the police department did such a bad job investigating this homicide when the true culprit was there, and they were they were talking with him. Uh, that uh, they were afraid that that they would be a bad light shed on them. And then you take the uh, prosecutor's office, who had to have known all of the details that I know because the, it's all in the file for anybody to read. Present a affidavit for probable cause for arrest to a judge that didn't contain exculpable information and then uh, push for a conviction of life imprisonment, uh, albeit that they had reduced it to life imprisonment with parole if he signed the paperwork. And, and, and that brings up another issue. Uh, why would you accept a plea of no contest for murder unless you knew you had a weak case? So, in my mind, it was all about uh, this group of uh, professional prosecutors and police uh, officials protecting their image and their integrity. But I had a lot to learn because that's not what it was all about. When I began to make this public, <coughs> I started receiving uh, communications from people that lived in Hawaii who had run across the same type of situation that I was running across trying to get the police to investigate crimes and trying to get the prosecutors and the attorney generals involved in their cases, which basically really had nothing to do with the murder case of little Tracy Woolsey Ruff, but that it had everything to do with the misdeeds and corruption going on within the legal system in Hawaii. And uh, it wasn't long before I recognized that it wasn't going to be uh, possible to get any justice out of any of this with the uh, legal system within the Hawaii, and that the only answer really was to get a grand jury involved. There's two kinds of grand juries. Um, there are local grand juries who operate separately, um, operate under the same uh, conditions as a federal grand jury, and then there's the federal grand jury. And 
I have had the highest respect for the FBI and the Justice Department on a federal level in all of my almost 20 years as a police officer. And so it was my goal to present this or get the investigation going on the federal level. So I had a federal level case in the murder of Tracy Woolsey Rupp, but my fear was that the feds, I present them with the option of a federal grand jury would say, well, why don't you go local with this? It's a local case. It's already been local, locally investigated. Why, why, why are you coming on the federal level? And uh, my answer would be because I believe there's federal corruption and there's a uh, collusion of entities involved in this trying to stop me from uh, bringing this uh, to uh, the federal level via the grand jury. So what I did was I decided that I would include uh, some charges that would get their ear, uh, primarily the uh, RICO Act, the Federal Organized Crime Protection Act. And that's what I had when I added together the cases of some of these other citizens that were complaining about the same situation with me. I had a classic RICO Act. I had obstruction of justice in there. I had money laundering, all kinds of different federal crimes with evidence to prove it from these people. And in reality, you don't really need a evidence-laden case to bring to a grand jury. You can go with just suspicion. And you can, and you as a private citizen have the right to ask and have implemented grand jury on either level. It's guaranteed to us by the U.S. Constitution. Uh, so, as a investigator and as a U.S. citizen, I put together a affidavit request for a grand jury and presented it to uh, Federal Judge Seabright in Kauai. The types of crimes that were involved in this involved financial institutions in Hawaii. The Kauai or the Hawaii Community Fund was involved. First Hawaiian Bank was involved and major players were involved in accepting money that was allegedly uh, obtained through fraudulent uh, means. You can read about all of these individual cases by uh, going to my website and opening up the uh, links that I provided for the um, affidavits for presentation to a grand jury that uh, get de very detailed about what happened in each one of these cases. Um, there's actually, you see, one, two, three, four separate allegations of fraud against private attorneys and the transference of money interstate, by the way, into the uh, community, Hawaii Community Fund and banks. And there's um, three deceased um, uh, victims that are listed in here where the, uh, the, the victim is a deceased person who whose estate went to the other victims, which would be their relatives, where it was legal thievery of property using questionable uh, and fraudulent uh, legal avenues in front of judges to get judgment on uh, legal documents that provided the transfer of deed. And the others are uh, involving actually money laundering, which is what I call it, it's the big one, but fraudulently gaining access to deceased uh, inheritances left for the families, and, and rightly so. Uh, but the Hawaii Community Foundation uh, believes they're entitled to that. And they'll apparently do anything at, a, at an arm's length with these uh, lawyers roaming around trying to make money. Now, <clears throat> I, I can mention one case here that is probably noteworthy, is uh, the fact of... Um, the case of um, Stanley Z Zadalis. Stanley Z Zadalis was a man who retired in Hawaii. Actually, he didn't retire in Hawaii. He was transported from California to Hawaii so that he could be subject to the court uh, courts in Hawaii. In Hawaii. Uh, and, and this was arranged by our old friend Paul Sulla. Now, uh, Stanley uh, Zadalis was an older man and uh, needed needed assistance in doing some things, but there wasn't anything wrong with him that I know about uh, affected his mental capacity to conduct business on his own. 
he turned up dead. And Paul Sulla was representing uh, one member of the family who didn't like the original will and desire and wanted a, a will that was more favorable to her. Uh, so she traveled all the way to from Hawaii to um, San Diego, California, snagged her father up, took a couple hundred thousand dollars of money out of the bank account that was on a trust fund and presented uh, fraudulent documents to do that because the bank, otherwise the bank could be held liable for that, brought the money back to Hawaii and the, the real uh, beneficiaries of the trust haven't seen the money since, even today, even though the judge ruled that the uh, uh, trust documents uh, were questionable. It's unknown who actually has that money. Now, I can probably guess who has it, but the interesting point, uh, the interesting thing I want to bring up about this case is, after Mr. Zadalis died, the family uh, wanted to uh, gain custody of the body so that he could be buried uh, in another state with his wife. With his Paul Sulla didn't want that. He wanted the body cremated. I don't think he gave a damn where it was buried, but he wanted that body cremated, and the judge ruled against him. Now, why Why would an attorney ask cremation versus a regular burial? Why, why would he care? Why do you think? So here's where it gets interesting. I, I put all these cases together in an affidavit, an informal motion to Judge Seabright, the head federal judge in Hawaii, and asked for my documents to be given to the sitting grand jury. They have grand juries sitting all the time in case they're needed. So I did this. This was back in uh, December 2015. I immediately got a letter from Seabright's head clerk that stated they weren't accepting it, and that if I didn't come and get the documents, they were going to destroy them. They are going to destroy court documents. That's a violation in itself. So I called up this court clerk. <coughs> Her name is Leon Abernathy, also a prior member, uh, a prior employee of the Justice Department. They had a long conversation, recorded, of course. Why? What law gives you the right to destroy my documents and to decline giving them to a grand jury? Her answer was, it's a general opinion around here. And my question comeback question was, well, whose opinion? Is it the judge's opinion? Or is it a group of judges? Or is it you? Or is it your colleagues in the judge's uh, office? Who is it? And she said, it's just a general opinion. So I said, thank you. Then I sent a long email to uh, Judge Seabright himself. And believe it or not, you, if you look hard enough, you can get those emails. And I explained to him why I believed this uh, case needed to go to a grand jury. And I reminded him of the Fifth Amendment to the Constitution, as well as Rule 6 of the Federal Rules of Procedure, Court Judicial Procedure. I didn't get an answer back from the judge himself. Uh, I can imagine why. But I did get a phone call from the same lady who threatened to destroy my documents. And this phone call said that uh, they were, in fact, going to present my documents to the grand jury on the following Thursday. This would have been in January, about January 8th or so. Okay, great. So, three, four, five months go by. Nothing. No investigation, as far as I'm concerned, as an investigator. I know the very first thing you do when you get a case like this is you call the person who made the complaint and verify all the information that he gave and try to get more information if you can. Nada. Nothing. So I had a friend, a uh, journalist of mine, make a call to the court and ask, inquire about it. And he recorded it also. And he also talked to Miss Abernathy, who was the head clerk. And there, in the recording she says, uh, yes, uh, the information is given to the court. We don't know what's happening because we don't have any contact with the with the grand jury. I mean, the information was given to the grand jury, and we don't have any contact with them. It's against the law, yada, yada, yada. Uh, so, okay, another sign that the things are rolling along. 
And then I got contacted by another victim, uh, Mrs. Duran, whose husband died. And Paul Stella was involved in that one. And all of a sudden, the husband's property is being uh, taken by Paul Stella, including the house they live in. <laughs> so I make a phone call to Miss um, Abernathy and Judge Sweert's court. And I said, look, I got another victim here. Who is it that's doing the investigation? I can either send it to you directly or uh, I can get in contact with the person personally and make this uh, uh, information available to them. And she said, well, you're going to have to contact the uh, U.S. attorney. That's who's involved in this. I said, okay. Called up the U.S. attorney, ran the situation by them, and they, uh, we don't know nothing about this. Well, you better call the FBI because the investigation isn't being done by this office. So I called the FBI, same response, don't know nothing, except the agent that I talked to said, well, what's the docket number on this, or what's the case number? And I said, I don't know, I never got receipt will get us the case number and maybe we can find it because as far as we know there's nothing going on with that. So months went by back and forth with Abernathy but via email and finally in one email I was saying to her look I've got this victim here you must uh, the law says you have to sign a case number to all the documents coming into the court what's the docket number on this so I can get uh, information to the FBI or or to whoever's doing it. And she said in her email, we didn't give the information to the grand jury, and we didn't give it a docket number. But I did make a phone call to the U.S. Attorney's Office and explain to them about the case. But I don't remember who I talked to. Here's what you told me. Of course, you have a copy of that. So here I have a federal judge squashing a grand jury investigation. That's exactly what's going on. So that's a, that's a big deal. The problem is you can't bring charges against a federal judge for actions they commit in court. That's not really the case here. This didn't go to court, and it wasn't a decision that he made. He made it on his own. And any decisions that judges make on their own, they're not protected by the umbrella of no prosecution. So that's basically what this request for intervenement is made to the Ninth Circuit. That's basically what this is all about. But prior to filing this uh, motion for intervenement to the Ninth Circuit, I had made an actual formal complaint uh, to the same court, the Ninth Circuit, on Judge Seabright for failing to do his duty, failing to transfer these documents to the grand jury as I had requested. And I got a letter back from someone in the court signed by the judge that my ju my uh, allegations were unfounded. Now, so I appealed it because I can't believe that any judge that looks at the evidence that I had here on Seabright would say it was unfounded. First of all, they claimed I couldn't make a complaint on Abernathy because I wasn't going through the right process to complain against a court employee. Uh, I reminded them in my appeal that I wasn't complaining against Abernathy. I was complaining against the judge who was responsible for Abernathy's actions. And then I included all the evidence that I had uh, been and I have been talking to you about with my appeal, and I haven't heard back to them back from them, whether it was accepted or what, but when you make an appeal uh, on a complaint to a judge, then it goes to a panel of judges who look over what you have and make a decision on whether you have grounds or not to actually request an investigation into Seabright's actions. But, but even if they do accept it and they do find Seabright guilty of something, of one of the charges that I'm asking, they really can't do anything to a federal judge. That that can only be done by Congress. Congress appoints the judges, and they're the ones that can impeach them. But they they have administrative things, uh, penalties that they can level against Judge Seabright. But really, uh, not much. Uh, Seabright is basically dealing with impunity here, except for uh, private felony charges, which is what I'm trying to do 
with this uh, asking for intervenement by the Ninth Circuit. Judge Seabright, Abernathy, and whoever else was involved in, in disposing of my documents have all committed crimes. All, all of them, including Seabright. He's the one held responsible for the actions, and he knows about them. But he made a mistake when he answered to my original allegations of impropriety in the courts to the Ninth Circuit. He said that he couldn't give the documents to the grand jury without having it first investigated by the Justice Department, which is not true. And here's why. We have the uh, Fifth Amendment to the Constitution, which deals with a person's right to get involved with a grand jury as a citizen. But we have other things uh, that support that Fifth Amendment. And one of them is the Federal Rules of Criminal Procedure uh, put, toge uh, put together by uh, the, US the U.S. Supreme Court. And, and what it says is, in general, when the public interest so requires, the court must order that one or more grand juries be summoned. A grand jury must have 16 to 23 members, blah, blah, blah. So the court rules themselves say, uh, give the uh, court uh, the authority to convene a grand jury. It doesn't say anything about the justices, Justice Department. So let's see um, how the court has applied uh, these rules and regulations and the Fifth Amendment uh, to actual cases. And this is a very important one, and it's going to take a few minutes because they really elaborated elaborated a lot on the use of grand juries in our country even though this case isn't exactly the same situation that I'm talking about what they say about the grand jury is and here's uh, the first paragraph it says whereas the grand jury is an institution separate from the courts over whose functioning the courts do not preside any power federal courts may have to fashion on their own initiative rules of grand jury procedure is very limited and certainly would not permit the reshaping of the grand jury institution that would be uh, the consequences of the proposed rule here, referring to the case that they're dealing with. Moreover, motions to quash indictments based on the sufficiency of the evidence relied upon by the grand jury have never been allowed, and it would make little sense to abstain from reviewing the evidentiary support for the grand jury's judgment while scrutinizing the sufficiency of the prosecutor's presentation. So what they're saying here is that the court doesn't have anything to do with deciding who gets to have a grand jury or who doesn't or what documents are proposed to the grand jury or what isn't. They're saying the grand jury functions on its own. And, and you'll notice, not one time do they mention uh, the involvement of the Justice Department. When you have a federal judge making decisions such as Judge Seabright did as to uh, uh, who investigates allegations of wrongdoing and who doesn't, when the litigant is specifically saying, we want a grand jury involved in this because we're alleging corruption within the Department of Justice, and then you have a judge saying, well, we're going to give it back to the Department of Justice. Uh, uh, number one, that's not uh, within the power of the judge to do that. Number two, if you have any kind of uh, joint agreement or collusion between the Justice Department and the uh, federal courts, you have a violation of uh, separation of powers in this country, and that violates the separation of power doctrine. So uh, Judge Seabright is uh, digging himself uh, a hole, I would have, it would appear, but that's not all. Let's go on with this particular Williams case. The Supreme Court goes on uh, with their uh, description of the powers of the courts versus the grand jury. And uh, this paragraph says, quote, The grand jury's functional independence from the judicial branch is evident both in the scope of its power to investigate criminal wrongdoing and in the manner in which the, that power is exercised. Unlike the court, whose jurisdiction is predicated upon a specific case or controversy, 
The grand jury can investigate merely on suspicion that the law is being violated, or even because it wants to assurance that it's not being violated. And then they support that opinion by the United States versus R Enterprises Inc. It was case 498 in the U.S. 292-297. Now here again, uh, the Supreme Court is telling us uh, that the Supreme the, the grand jury is an investigative entity in itself. And so uh, where Judge Seabright gets the information that he needs another entity to investigate allegations of criminal wrongdoing is beyond me. The Justice Department, uh, when they're involved in a grand jury case, is one of support and, and one of... Um, assistance. And so if they do any investigating uh, for the grand jury, it's at the behest of the grand jury. Uh, the grand jury will request, we want uh, some help investigating this, and that's their option to do that, and they, uh, then the Justice Department is obligated to do so. But for a federal judge to say, wait a minute, we're not. this doesn't go to the grand jury until after the investigation uh, by the Justice Department, who happens to be listed as a defendant in the case, is unconscionable. And uh, why this unfounded in a complaint is way, is beyond my imagination, actually. And, and to make matters worse uh, for Judge Seabright, uh, the Supreme Court goes on to say, the grand jury requires no authorization from its constituting court to initiate investigation. Okay, that's pretty plain. They're saying, we don't care what the court says. The Supreme Court goes on to say, the grand jury requires no authorization from its constituting court to initiate an investigation. Uh, nor does the prosecutor require leave of court to seek a grand jury indictment. And in its day-to-day -day functioning, the grand jury generally operates without the interference of a presiding judge. You can't get any more plain than that. And here we have a classic case of the judge interfering in what the grand jury is going to in uh, investigate or not. And not only uh, do they operate without the interference of a presiding judge, it swears in its own witnesses, the grand jury does, and deliberates in total secrecy, the grand jury does. <coughs> and uh, they continue, we have insisted that the grand jury remain free to pursue its investigations unhindered by external influence or supervision so long as it does not trench upon the legitimate rights of any witness called before it. And that's based by, backed up by United States versus Dionisio. Recognizing this tradition of independence, we have said that the Fifth Amendment's Constitution guarantee presupposes an investigative body acting independently of either prosecution attorney or judge. And here we have the head federal judge of District of Hawaii telling the Ninth Circuit that he can't give my information to the grand jury because it requires investigation by the Justice Department first. And so my predicament uh, actually in November of 2017, not too long ago, was this. Okay, so I've uh, gone through the process. I've tried to get an investigation uh, into a, a capital murder case by first the Kauai Police Department and then the um, Hawaii Attorney General's Office and then the uh, FBI and the Department of Justice, and all of them turned a blind eye and a blind ear to my allegations. And remember, they don't have to be substantiated by uh, evidence. Uh, only uh, the grand jury can investigate what they want to. However, in my case, I do have evidence, lots of it. So now I'm at the federal court level. And I have a judge saying, eh, I can't do nothing with it. First they've threatened to destroy the documents, and now they're saying they're not, they can't, they recognize the fact that the evidence is there, they just can't give it to the grand jury. So, 
what do I do? Um, my first inclination was to, okay, I'm going to ask for a change of venue. I'll go to uh, the Judge uh, Thomas of the Circuit Court and ask for a change of venue. And then uh, uh, let's see if I can get a grand jury in another district, one that's not so corrupt. Uh, but I'm not so sure that was the correct move to make. I even had an affidavit for a second grand jury prepared and ready to go. And I woke up in the middle of the night one night and said, no, what I'm going to ask is for the Ninth Circuit to get in involved in this themselves. Uh, if they want to change the venue, they can do it on their own. But it's, uh, I, I don't need to tell them uh, this is what's needed. So what I'm, I'm asking the Ninth Circuit in this motion to intervene. The goal is to get a grand jury to go back in, unzip the folder that holds this old murder case and start from scratch and bring some justice into the picture. So that's what this motion does. But as backup evidence listed on the evidence page, I have uh, listed the old affidavit file as evidence that I submitted this. And I have a new proposed grand jury file for um, the new circuit court judge to look at. And in this motion, I am suggesting to the judge that we do need two grand juries. We need one to pick up where um, the, old, the first one left off and go into the murder case, but we also need a second one. We need what's called a special grand jury to look into allegations of corruption and separation of power alleg allegations uh, between the Seabright Courts and the uh, Hawaii uh, Department of Justice, the Hawaii AG's office, and also into the uh, uh, U.S. Attorney's office. And by the way, during this period of time, there was no permanent U.S. Attorney. The, the, the one that was in uh, there uh, when I began uh, was appointed by the Obama administration and Trump asked for the resignation. So they've been operating with a um, ad hoc U.S. attorney until one's appointed and I don't think one's been appointed yet. So that's what this is all about. If you want to get into the meat of the thing and read everything that I've done, it's all available out there for the public now. And, and this is a this is a very important motion, and I'm sure that there are some bona fide constitutional attorneys looking at this because uh, Judge Thomas, uh, uh, the head um, Ninth Circuit Court judge, is bound to make a decision. He, he can do the same thing Seabright did and just ignore it because I didn't have a, uh, a docket number. No one, no, a docket number was never assigned to the case, and that's Judge Seabright doing, or he can deal with it. Uh, if he's a smart man, I think he's going to have to deal with it, because if he doesn't, he's in the mix with Seabright. He, he knows what the law is. Some of the laws uh, are made by the Supreme Court, some of them made by the Constitution. You can't just leave me flopping in the air again, because there's other areas I can go to if this doesn't work. So, God bless you all. Uh, take a look at what I've presented here. It's, it's done in honesty. I haven't made one dime in this. I have written a book uh, called The Fifth Seal. It's right here. It was completed uh, this year, but it obviously wasn't... Uh, I, I wrote it prematurely because I didn't have this... Uh, motion in there. But one of the last thing I want to say is that it goes back to the murder of a four-year-old girl. We have a, a person that has come forth and admitted his participation in that crime, and the family has supported me all through this whole thing. Uh, Timmy uh, Woolsey and his wife uh, um, have been uh, backing me up in this. I have received no funds from anybody 
to take this task on, and it, and it has been uh, significant to my pocketbook to do this. The book, um, uh, it hasn't caught on yet, so I haven't made too much money off of that. Uh, and all of this is covered in videos. If anything happens to me, I would like this video to be a testament to what I was trying to do and hopefully can be used to uh, go after anyone that might have had something to do with my demise. So God bless you all. Thank you.